All right. We have a, a few other faces that aren't normally in here because we uh, were combined with the class from Brother Dan's class upstairs. And so we're going to do a little bit of review in our lesson today because we just were getting into some of the notes here. And I want to review some of the content and the context before we move on into um, the rest of this lesson here and close it out today. So if you would open your Bibles to John chapter number six, John chapter number six, and this is uh, for concerning Philip the Apostle, scene number two, scene number two of Philip the Apostle. And th this encounter specifically comes out of John chapter number six. Now, um, if, if you can go ahead and pull up the slide, Brother Joe. So we, we mentioned this last week. We went through kind of a longer uh, little dissertation, or longer dissertation, if you will, on, on Israel and its size and location and things of that nature, just because I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of the geography that is involved in these things. And all, the, all of these resources are readily available online if you just Google map of Israel during Jesus' time. I mean, there's a ton of this kind of content out there. And so even this one specifically on the right, which is a close-up of the Sea of Galilee, which you'll see in the kind of northern blue pocket there in the top of the left map, that's a kind of zoomed-in area, uh, zoomed-in view here now of the, of the Sea of Galilee or the Lake Tiberias Lake. And so uh, something we'd covered previously um, regarding the origin of some of the apostles and where they were from, we referenced that they were from the city of Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida... Um, there's actually two different Bethsaidas on the Sea of Galilee that are referenced, and they're kind of referenced by their, or known by their, differentiated by their subsequent names after that. So you see in the top right, Bethsaida Julius. Now this is the hometown of Philip and John, or Philip and Andrew and Peter and Nathaniel and these other apostles who were from that area, and that's also where Jesus met um, uh, John and his brother so uh, they were John and James, they were from that area. So they're all from this, this, this fishing area, um, Bethsaida meaning house of the fishermen or house of fish. And it, that, on that north end is where the Jordan River feeds into this Sea of Galilee. Now, the other Bethsaida that you'll see on the map is on the left side um, of the top there. It says Bethsaida Galilee. Now, this, this name or, or this one um, has a lot of different names because of how the different um, empires or different cultures and such recognize the different areas. And so that city is also referenced as Tabga, T-A-B-G-H-A. And so if you look on a map and you may see one that says Tabga, that's this Bethsaida of Galilee. So there's these different um, Bethsaidas here. And so the, the encounter we're going to look at here in John chapter number 6 is happening in the Bethsaida Galilee, not in the Bethsaida Julius where the fishing, fishing town where they were from, but rather from the other side of the lake when it says that they crossed over. So it's talking about this left side of the lake. And then it's being called out there in the map. You'll see there's something that says the Gennesaret Valley. They had some large plains and hills in this region. And so this is where it's believed that the miracle of the loaves and the fishes that we're looking at here in John chapter number six took place because you would need a large enough place where you could sit down thousands and thousands. And we know that the men of the men were counted 5,000. That does not include women and children. So easily we're at 10 to 15,000 people who were there. Um, they didn't have any you know, large amphitheaters or anything in the area. And it says that they were set on the plains. And so um, it's believed to be that they were there. And this story took place in the Gennesaret Valley. Now, going, going to our notes here to start back here at the top of the page says here in the introduction, John once again shines the light on the obscure apostle called Philip. And this time he's in, number one, Bethsaida Julius. This is that, again, the northern region there, Bethsaida Julius. This is the other side of Galilee, which is number two on the east bank of the Jordan River. So again, that's, the, that's what we're talking about here. The, the west bank, number three, where Philip is from is a few hours' journey by boat, but even shorter by land around the head of the lake. The setting. It is clear that Jesus went by number four, the sea. And perhaps the apostles went by number five, the land. Because we know this is that Jesus crossed over, and it may have been that with the throng of people that were following him. Um, you have to imagine these people were following Christ, and so you have 10,000 10, plus people possibly 
all just walking along the, the seashore as best they can, following along, trying to follow Jesus to wherever he was going next. They were just so fixated on him and trying to be in his presence and see what he would do. So um, in the multitude, there were many with diseases and afflictions who came because they had seen others healed. So again, if you have your Bibles uh, and you're open to John chapter number 6, we'll, we'll reference this verse that's given here. John chapter number 6, verse, starting verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. So these weren't necessarily all just, oh, these are a whole bunch of healthy you know, people and everything else, but rather... Um, these, were, uh, these were people who were sick. There were people who were infirm, people who um, were, had needs of their own. And they're all coming to, again, seek an audience and to witness the miracles of Christ. So there were many who came for the Passover as well, as verse number 4 tells us. Because verse, verse 3, and Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. But verse 4, and the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. So anybody who was dwelling in the northern area of Galilee would begin, you know, heading south for their journey to Jerusalem to celebrate and partake in Passover there. So they're going to be heading down south for these things for the Passover. Um, so you would have these large crowds also traveling for those reasons as well. So there's this, a huge crowd moving along. Um, there was, and back in our notes, there are many who came for the Passover, but his chance, this chance encounter was conspicuous, not inconspicuous, or rather, it says conspicuous. So in other words, it was, it was done to be seen. Jesus withdraws up the hillside with his disciples to consider number six, the crowd. Number six, the crowd. Number seven, the circumstances. And number eight, the challenge. Number six, the crowd. Seven, the circumstances. And eight, the challenge. So as he heads up into this hill with his disciples, it's not really for himself that he has to stop and consider and wonder what he will do. Christ already knows what he's going to do. He has already, he has that foresight, um, divine foresight. He already knows what's going to happen, but rather the disciples are learning in real time. They're having to figure out as, the, as they go along, much as we do, what do we do next? How are we going to handle these things? So Jesus looks out over the multitude and calls to Philip with this consideration, number nine, this consideration, though he already has it under Control And so let's review as we did last week. We'll read through this, this context here after establishing some of this background. And let's read this story together in verse chap, John chapter 6, verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them, that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, we already know this. If, you're, if you've you know, read your Bible for any amount of time, you already understand. Jesus isn't actually asking him because he doesn't have the answer. Jesus is trying to initiate a, a conversation. He's trying to initiate a situation and a challenge and present it to Philip for Philip to then have his own faith challenge to, be, uh, to grow uh, in his faith in the Lord and these different things to, to, for Philip to realize where he's at. And so, so Philip is being asked this question and, and Pastor is nicknamed you know, him the practical apostle. He's just a very logical man. And so verse number 7 Here's his, here's his request. Or the, verse number 6 gives us insight into Christ and his, his, his questioning. He says, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus already knew how this was going to play out. He already knew all the things were going to happen. He knew the lad with the fishes and the loaves was probably at this very moment talking with Andrew or approaching them at this moment. So Jesus is already knowing all these things are in motion. But yet he turns to Philip in this moment and says, Hey, um, how do you think we're going to feed all these people here? If I asked any one of you, just for even this crowd here of, you know, 50 people, whatever we got here in the auditorium, if I said, hey, would you mind just running over, not Chick-fil-A because they're closed, but, you know, let's, let's go you know, run out to IHOP. Would you mind just going and just getting, you know, 50 orders of pancakes? And would you mind going and picking that up and bringing that here? Now, 
For some, maybe you'd be like, oh, 50 orders of pancakes, no big deal. That's chump change. But for some of us, then maybe I wasn't prepared to feed 50 people from a restaurant today, you know, a stack of pancakes. That's a lot to ask of a person to do last minute on the fly. We had no preparation. You know, it's not like, okay, Andy, in three months, you're going to buy pancakes for the, you know, for the congregation. This is an in the moment questioning. There's thousands of people. That, I mean, they're just all over the plains here. They're on this hillside looking down at them. And Jesus knows that people are hungry. He knows they're tired. And so he turns to his apostle and basically says, hey, how are, how are we, what's the plan for feeding all these people? Philip, I, I didn't know that was my part of the plan. That I, I, I didn't know that was my responsibility. But Jesus said this to prove him, to test him, to strengthen him. So verse number seven, here's Philip's answer. 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. And we went over this last week, but a penny worth is roughly a day's wages. So he says, if I worked for 200 days and saved everything I made over those 200 days, and then I went out and tried to buy bread, it still wouldn't be enough. And it says here that everyone may take a little. So it's not that, you know, if everyone just took off a little corner of a bread, you know, we cut up the bread slices into quarters and everyone just got one little tiny piece, it still would not be enough. He, there, he has a great sense of insufficiency in this moment. In verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? So Andrew here, with, a, with maybe just a, a very small measure of faith more than Philip, he doesn't say, oh, well, there's no way. Much like Philip essentially said that there's, there's no way that we, are, we have the sufficiency to feed all these people. Andrew says, I've got something. You know, we've, I've, this lad has come. He's willing to donate his lunch. I've got, you know, I can't buy pancakes for everybody, but I've got some goldfish crackers from the nursery next door. But, but what is that among so many? What is that? How is that going to make a difference? So Andrew presenting what he has, though, again, lacking the faith to understand just because, he, again, they're figuring this all out in real time. So verse 10, And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. And the disciples to them that were sat down. And likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. Philip's analysis said, Hey, if we just did as much as we can, we saved up everything we could, and we tried to did, uh, you know, give everyone something. Everyone would only be able, not even be able to take a little bit. We still wouldn't have enough. But with Christ and his miracle working power and the offering that was made of these loaves and fishes, everyone took as much as they would. Have you ever been to like a restaurant or maybe a buffet or maybe like one of the church picnics or something like that? And you're kind of towards the back of the line and you can see the dish you want start to diminish in the pan you're like, oh man, I really want a piece of that, you know, apple pie or whatever it is. But it just I can see slices of it disappearing as I'm getting closer to the table. And, and then you get there and it's gone. There, there was nothing like that. They didn't see the basket of fish depleting and, oh man, I really could, I'm so hungry. I need a couple of fish for my family. And by the time it got to them, oh, there's not enough. Everyone was able to take as much as they would. So everyone had sufficient for their need. So verse 12, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. So not only was there enough, but with God, there was more than enough. So a, a, a fascinating passage here again. And as we look at Philip's role in this, in this situation, we consider these things. So moving on into our notes here where it says, note uh, on page one, Philip's response is from his rather practical perspective. Estimating the number of men in the multitude, um, men, number 10, in the multitude, plus number 11, women and children, and the number of loaves to feed them, resulting in realizing that would take a sizable amount of number 13 money. And in Luke nine twelve, the apostles' response was to send the multitudes away. There's, 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 there's reference to that. Hey, they, they were like, hey, there's no way we could do it. We've just got to send them all back home. But 
uh, there are too many men, not enough money. And where would you get all that meat and bread to feed such a multitude? It would take a miracle in order to do such a thing. And the fill in the blank there in the parentheses uh, we have here, isn't that what they came looking for? The people came in verse number two because they knew of the miracles. Now, they weren't expecting, you know, this amazing meal multiplication miracle to, to be taking place. But rather, they, they came to seek, you know, someone to be healed or someone, something of that nature, demons to be cast out, whatever it may be. They came seeking those things. They came looking for a miracle, and exactly, it's exactly what they got. So, um, moving on now to um, the scene. John the Baptist recently murdered... Um, the sheep were without a chef, shepherd, but John had pointed them to Jesus as they came seeking the crowds, and they grew from more, number 15, to many, 16, to the multitudes, 17. So more to many to multitudes. Our Lord speaks pointedly and personally to Philip, who being the practical one has already taken a head count, considered the conditions, and investigated the resource. Maybe, you know, he checked with Judas what kind of finances they had. But according to his calculations in verse 7, 200 penny worth of bread, that's a lot of money, but it would not be enough. Now, I'd like to consider this next paragraph here. Since a penny was a working man's wage, that would be a sizable amount. So we would not be surprised at his reply in light of the limited resources. But rather, verse 6 reveals to us that this was a test. But Philip focused on number 18, the multitude. Number 19, the money. And number 20, the mathematics. The multitude, the money, and the mathematics. And instead, rather, of focusing on number 21, the master. He looked at all the things that were available to him rather than, I mean, we, he could have simply said, you know, when Jesus said, hey, how, what's your plan on feeding them? Lord, I don't have a plan except you do something amazing. That, that would be, hey, I'm considering that the only answer to this solution is found in the master. And that would have been that kind of faith-filled answer that we could have looked at. But rather, there's this revealing of just a very simple logical, a reasonable answer from Philip that there's no way that I, in, in my own capacity, in my own sufficiency, am able to, to, to cover and to do these things that are necessary. So I'd like us to consider, we're going to depart from the notes for a moment, but it's all too easy to look at these disciples over the last several months and think to ourselves, how could you not see it? Have you ever read that in the, in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you know, maybe situations like this, and you think, you're literally walking with the miracle-working Messiah. You're seeing him heal people. There's people who can't walk. There's people who have demon possession, people who can't see, you know, people who have dead children, and they're all being raised from the dead. All these amazing things are happening. People are walking on the water. The storms are being calmed and all that. And we can look at all that and say... How in the world could you not consider Jesus Christ when he's standing right there next to you? It's very easy to get into that perspective because we're reading it because we know the end. We're reading it from this kind of third person perspective that we're looking in on this story. And we're saying, how could you do this? Don't you know this is coming in just a couple of verses, Philip? Don't you know that this is going to happen? But he doesn't. And it's very easy to look at them from this perspective, you know, and asking, how can you fear when he is literally standing in front of you? But yet if somebody, let's say we're reading the book of Andy, could they not say the same thing about my life? If my life were going to be, was, was to be written in all the different situations that I have faced personally, and somebody was to sit down and read that, couldn't they say the same thing about my life? That there are times where I feared where I fretted, where I was um, acting out of, uh, I was too stressed out. I was too burdened by responsibilities and everything else. I took too much upon myself at different times. And when someone could look at my story and say, why didn't you just trust God? Not only, you know, back then they had the physical um, embodiment of God in their, in their presence with Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. 
you know, these people had to travel so far. You know, we got the, the, the lady who traveled from, says she was, a, you know, a, a, she was a, from the land of Sidon, I believe, um, there on the coast in Phoenicia. She traveled all the way down trying to get an audience with Jesus. She wasn't even an Israelite. Yet she still came down. She was um, a Gentile. And so these people would seek these audiences with Christ and they tried to seek him. And you know, the Samaritan woman, these people didn't know who he was because they hadn't learned of him yet. And also you had to go to him. We don't have to do that. We don't have to go. It, Jesus is not just present here at church. Some people have that thinking that, oh, well, God's at church. So I'm going to go to church and I'm going to go be with God. No, God is with you. If you're saved, if you're a child of God, he's with you all the time. You don't have to go and find him. You don't have to, you know, go onto social media, onto Facebook and say, okay, where did he last check in at? So I need him to try to catch up with him. And I got some questions. I need, I need something from him. I got to go, you know, request some things. I have some needs I need to make sure he knows about. You don't have to do that. He's with you all the time. And so again, people could look at maybe the, our own story and they could look at us and say, man, you had the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You, you had the completed These men did not have the completed word of God. We have the completed entire counsel of God at our disposal in print, electronically. We can memorize it, hide it in our hearts. We have all these tools and we can look at people like Philip or Old Testament Israel and say, how could you? How how could you do? How could you fear? How could you turn from God again? How could you build up these you know places of false worship and these false idols? And how can you say that? Oh, this calf delivered us from Egypt and whatever. You can go through all the different encounters and you could say, how could you even think of this? Again, I want to be cautious before we get too judgmental of these previous characters because if someone were writing our story, what would they see like that? What would they see, man? Andy was just so stressed out about his finances during that, that period of time. And little did he know God had, the, God had the answer. Why didn't he talk to God about it? Why did he try to figure it out for himself? Why did he just try to work harder? Why did he try to do this or that? Or, you know, having you know, problems in, in, in relationships or, you know, whatever else. There's so many things that are outside of our control and that we fret over and we stress. And rather than just looking to the miracle worker who, again, is abiding in our hearts... We have his word. Rather than going to those sources and saying, Lord, what's the answer? You lead me. You guide me. We take so much on ourselves. And Philip, very much in the same way, does that here. Doubts can appear to be, and often are, reasonable. As I presented, even just with this room, if I asked any one of you, if I said, okay, Andrew, I need you to go out, go run to IHOP and buy those pancakes for everybody, he'd be like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I didn't, I didn't save up. I didn't plan for this. This is not my budget for the week and whatever else. And so it's reasonable for him to say, there's no way I can do that. It's not like he has a, this complete lack of faith or whatever else, but it's very reasonable. And doubt in our lives when it comes to things we can't control or we can't get an answer to, doubts can be very reasonable. It doesn't mean that you're completely off base in that regard. Um, he wasn't... He wasn't um, Philip was not out of sync with the situation in that regard. That he looked at it, he was like, oh yeah, pff, no problem. Let me just go run to the quick mart real quick. I'm going to go grab some you know, potato chips and we'll start passing them out. No, he, he had a reasonable analysis of the situation in verse 7 where he says that 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. He understood the magnitude of the situation. And indeed there were too many mouths to feed and not enough money. And even Andrew added on to the logical and reasonable with his addition. So in verse number 9... He, 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 again, he steps out a little bit more and says, hey, I've got something, but man, what are we going to do with it? I've got this lab with the loaves and fishes, but what are these, what are they among so many? We do not exist only in a tangible, physical, and reasonable world. Those things do exist indeed, but they are also subject to those invisible and spiritual things. In Ephesians chapter number 6, verses 12 and 13, The scriptures say, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So the things we face in this world, we don't just fight the physical and the, the logical and the reasonable, but rather there is, again, the, there is this spiritual realm. There is an element of faith that must be carried through. And we must look at this sense of our, our reality through the eyes of faith and not through the eyes 
of reason. Many people have been, Pastor and I were talking about this earlier, earlier this week, many people, you know, well-intentioned believers, they get under the influence of a lot of very humanistic or agnostic or even atheist thinking, and they listen to a lot of uh, read books or they listen to a lot of podcasts and interviews and they watch these things and their 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 perspective of rather than looking at life and reality through the lens of faith they look at it through the lens of reasoning well what can i reason away what can i explain what seems again maybe logical faith is not always logical we have substance and we have evidence like pastor Kirshner preached uh, just the other day we have substance and evidence of things that we can hope for but our our faith is not always, again, logical, but it has its root in it. And so we don't want to get stuck like Philip, where we just look at the challenges of our life and say, ah, I can't do that. There's no way that can happen. You know, if I was to ask any one of you today, if I called you this morning and said, hey, whew, I'm not feeling good. I'm not going to make it to church. Uh, Miss Jamie, would you please take the Sunday school and, and teach the Sunday school class this morning? I'm sure that would probably throw many a person off to say, hey, I, I have not looked at the material. I'm not accustomed to public speaking or whatever else, and now I have to get up and do that. And we can, we can look at situations in our life and say, oh, there's no way that could happen. There's no way I could do that. But don't forget the element of faith. Yes, we need to look at things logically and reasonably. You know, the scriptures say, come and let us reason together. But we cannot leave off faith. And Philip and and Andrew had a difficult struggle with this as they look at it, just as we often do. That they looked at it from the earthly perspective and not from the spiritual perspective. So Philip, the practical apostle, was, attack, was attacking this from the carnal earthly perspective, not the heavenly one that Jesus was portraying before them. So back in our notes here to finish out this note here at the bottom of the page, it says the situation was real and Philip was right. The apostles didn't have the resources in the hand, but... The resources were at hand, but a lesson of believing faith had to be learned first. So Jesus is using this moment to teach them. And we can, as we've said over and over with many of these different apostles, we can look at our situations of life. We face a hardship. We face a difficulty. We face an obstacle. And we can automatically begin to think, well, something's wrong. You know, this, per this isn't supposed to be this way. But guess what? Sometimes it is supposed to be that way. Because sometimes, like verse number 6 tells us, and this he did to prove them. That God has placed this challenge, he has placed this obstacle in your life to prove you, to grow you. So you can see where you're lacking faith. You can see where you're missing the mark. You can see where you, you've uh, not done the things that he asked you to do. And so he puts the obstacle in front of you for you to realize, much like these men, I can't do it on my own. I'm relying on my own strength. I'm relying on my own sufficiency. And it is not enough. So this illustration here uh, on the next page is, is quite interesting. Uh, some people will take this topic and can go very far with it. Um, but pa Pastor points out here some interesting tie-ins uh, throughout, the, throughout the scriptures. And this illustration says, on a side note, it is interesting that Philip chose the number 200. John Philip is noteworthy um, to consider uh, many of these different encounters that we're going to look at. And so if you haven't heard it, there's this term called biblical numerology. And people will take numbers throughout the scriptures and, and they will determine meanings to those numbers. And then from that, they try to extrapolate deeper truths, if you will, that they try to discover in scripture. And as I mentioned, some people, you know, take this, this concept and they just run with it. And every, every number in life means something. And so everything they see in Oh, my meal cost six dollars and seventy three cents. Well, the number six hundred and seventy three means this, or the six times seventy three, and like every, everything has to have some big, deeper, you know, kind of meaning or something of that nature. But there are numbers in Scripture that are significant and do represent different things. And so I wrote down just a couple of them here. Number six is symbolic of humanity. Often, if you see the number six, it's representative of humanity, which number seven represents spiritual perfection. And so you think about it, six is not quite seven. So, yes, we're the crown of God's creation, but six is just not enough. Seven is spiritual perfection, and that comes only from God. We know the number 40 is very, very, very frequently used, Old Testament and New, to be symbolic of trial and testing. And so, you know, Moses was 40 years old when he left. He was in the wilderness for 40 years, and the man who had his eyes, you know, uh, one of the men 
in the New Testament who had his eyes healed by Jesus. He was blind 40 years. The number 40 is used all, all throughout Scripture in those regards. And so, again, if you decide to do your own study on that, you're welcome to. I would just, again, be very cautious who you're reading. When I was just looking up some of these notes for this lesson, um, some people were going to some pretty great extremes with these numbers. But it's interesting, it's interesting to read, no doubt. So in the note here, John Phillips is noteworthy in considering Achan and Ai and the spoils of Jericho in Joshua chapter 7. In failing faith, he stole 200 shekels of silver and lost everything. Absalom, the rebellious son who sought to steal a kingdom, in his arrogant pride pulled his hair, his hair annually and it weighed 200 shekels. In his vain beauty and rebellious pride, ultimately he was hung by his hair and died. And much like Achan and Ai um, in that situation, um, the thing that he stole again ended up becoming his downfall because of those things. In Judges 17, Micah steals 1,100 shekels of silver (coughs) from his mother, then frightened by 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 her curses, returns it. His mother melts down 200 shekels and makes his idols and images. Micah hires himself a Levite to be a private priest who then sells out to the tribe of Dan. That Levite is the grandson of Moses, and they changed his name to, I'm sorry, uh, named Jonathan, son of Gershom, the son of Moses. And the Hebrews were so angry with the grandson of Moses that they changed the name to Manasseh. Now, those 200 shekels of silver are the idols they formed, brought disaster to Dan, and their name was blotted out. And another illustration is one more that Ezra brought back with him, a band of 200 singing men and women to help establish true worship. But it was not sufficient. The people needed to hear the word of the law in Nehemiah 8. So why 200? Practical as Philip may be, faith uh, faith that produces is pragmatic. Believing is seeing. So, and then a big, bold, or the larger font here says 200 penny worth is not enough without God. So to simply put, if, if the, there's, not this huge, greater, deeper meaning to it, but obviously just tying into these other references, basically where 200 was used in the scriptures, and it didn't work out well for people. It wasn't enough. It wasn't what God wanted for them. And so Philip, in the same way, is saying, hey, you know, 200 penny worth, it's not sufficient. It's not enough. And yes, indeed, this is definitely the case here in this passage. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we won't find a significant difference in Andrew's response, as we read in verses 8 and 9 because he's still doing a visual mathematic equation that yields similar results. And that is number 22, too many. Number 23, too much. Number 24, too little. So there's too many people, there's too much need, and there's too little resources. And the focus, again, was on the resource instead of the source. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, that we may look at our bank account. We may look at you know, what we have at home. We may look at the, the, the possessions that God has given us. And we look at our resources that we got from the source, which is God. And we try to find our answers among those things. We try to, you know, by, hopefully by faith step out, but often just are limited by our own understanding that we look at these different things and situations and say, well, this is what I got. What am I, how, can I, how can I accomplish this? How can I fix this problem? Whatever it is. And that's the thing that we are looking at in regards to these situations. We're looking at the resource instead of the source. And ultimately, this is the key to fixing your perspective on your lack of sufficiency. As long as we are looking for a resource and not the source, there will be fear, doubt, frustration, and stress. If we think the answer is going to come in a resource in the sense of, again, I have to do this, I have to get that, uh, I, you know, whether it's possessions gained or finances coming in or more hours at work or you know, I have to have this conversation and I have to talk these things out and I have to figure all these problems out. As long as if we're looking for the resource and we've stopped looking at the source of where the sufficiency comes from, we're going to constantly be dealing with, again, doubt, fear, frustration, stress, all these things. Because that's not where the answer lies. The answer does not lie in the resource, but rather in the source of where those things come from. That we know that every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So every good thing we have in our life comes from God. And that's what we need to be looking to. 
We need to be looking to those things that come from God, not just, again, the looking for the thing that's in our hand that will fix the situation that we're in. There's one source for everything we need, no matter what. It all comes back to what we see when we look at Christ. Now, to, to finish out the page here, <clears throat> excuse me, in the note, it says it took a miracle, literally. It took a literal miracle to accomplish this and to convince the apostles that Jesus Christ truly is the Messiah that they had been seeking. Philip, in all his practical consideration, would see, only, or would see what only Jesus can do. And if I was to ask you, I'm going to ask for a little bit of participation here. It's not a lot. It's just a raising of hand. How many of us want to see the Lord do something great in your life? How many of you say, I want God to do something great in my life? Can we get, how many of you would raise your hand? I think just about everybody. Now, God doing something great in your life means it has to go beyond what you can do. Because I didn't say, I want you to do something great. I said, how many of us want to see God do something great? Uh, it's, I believe it's, uh, it's either 1 Corinthians 12 or 2 Corinthians 12. I can't remember off the top of my head here. But where Paul is praying and he says, Lord, I've got this thorn in my side. You know, I've got, I've got this thing that's ailing me, and, um, whether it's physical or mental, whatever it was. And he said, I prayed that the Lord would take it away from me. And the answer he got is that my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. If God is going to do something great in your life, that means you're not. You're not the one doing something great. God is. So it's not something you can do. And if it's not something you can do, then it's too much for you. It's too big for you. It's like Philip looking at this crowd and saying, that I, there's no way I can, I can help. I can't do what is needed and what is sufficient for this situation to be resolved. I can't do it. That's the realm where God steps in. That's the realm where then we get to see the strength of God being made man manifested in front of us is when it goes beyond us. So if you want to see God do something great in your life, if you want to witness the, the miracle working power of God, that means you need to be in need of a miracle. You've got to be in the place where you can no longer do anything about it. And that's a scary place to be. Because once you get to that place, you don't know what, what the answer is. You don't know how long you'll be there. You know, how long are you going to be struggling with this? Um, again, a financial thing. Everyone can identify with these different areas of, of practical living that there's an area where I don't have enough. I don't know how this is going to last. I don't know what the answer is, but I know I have a miracle working God. And if we want to see him work, that means it's got to be something beyond us, something that we cannot control, something we cannot fix. So we know Philip was seeking, number 25, the Messiah. Number 25, we know Philip was seeking the Messiah. We know Philip was led to find, number 26, the man. <clears throat> and we know Philip heard, number 27, the message. And ultimately, number 28, Philip saw the miracles and found the Messiah. So number 25, the Messiah... Number 26, the man. Number 27, the message. And ultimately, Philip saw the miracles, 28, and found the Messiah. Number 29. And in conclusion, verse number 15, we haven't read that yet. Let's look at that. It says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now, in the conclusion, it is very interesting that they found the Christ, but not the connect the correct chronology. They saw the miracles of Christ and believed that this was the Messiah who would come and free Israel and, and would come to set up his um, heavenly reign here on earth. That is not the right time yet. And so that this was not why he came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. This was not the time to rule and reign. And so how much did they really comprehend about the ministry of Jesus Christ? Philip is learning, but there's a lot left to learn before living his life fully for Jesus. Your sufficiency, like all those present that day, is in the Savior. Why would we look for something else? What good has it done? If we look around us, we can see that riches don't always bring the right answers. The vices that man um, will turn to don't bring the answers and don't bring the sufficiency. 
selfishness, just pride, taking it on ourselves and saying, I can do it myself, I don't need any help, that didn't help anybody. Or again, just trying to look inside your own self and just willing things to happen or wishing that they would. None of those things bring the answers that we so desperately need. But rather, very simply, He is all you need. And when He is all you need, you have enough to go around and then some. So such a, such a wonderful story here in John chapter number 6 as we've considered Philip in this story. And um, next Sunday we'll be having a guest missionary with us um, here in the uh, Sunday school hour. And so we'll continue on with our study on Philip the following week after that on the 28th. Thank you.